Shalom Aleichem, welcome. I'm Lisa Newman, the Yiddish Book Center's Director of Publishing and Public Programs, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you this evening to our virtual theater for tonight's program, Endangered Jewish Languages, Spotlight on Iranian and Bukharian Jews, with Sarah Benor and Ruben Shimonov. Tonight's program is co-sponsored with 7,000 Languages a nonprofit public charity that helps indigenous communities around the world teach, learn, and sustain their languages through technology. They are the only nonprofit in the world that creates free online courses for endangered language revival. Before we get started, just a few things to mention. You will be muted throughout and the video will be off. You may send us your questions in the question panel, which in most instances is located at the bottom right of your screen. We ask that you refrain from comments and keep questions short so that we can try to get to all of them this evening. If for some reason you have trouble with Zoom, we suggest that you shut down and log in again and usually that clears the problem, but hopefully none of that will happen. I'm delighted to um, welcome tonight's presenters. Sarah Benor is Professor of Contemporary Jewish Studies and Linguistics at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, Los Angeles. Her books, Becoming From, How Newcomers Learn the Language and Culture of Orthodox Judaism, Languages in Jewish Communities, Past and Present, and Hebrew Infusion, Language and Community at American Jewish Summer Camps. Dr. Benor is co-editor of the Journal of Jewish Languages, and creator of Jewish Language Website and the Jewish English Lexicon. We're also delighted and proud to say that Sarah is a two-time alumna of the Yiddish Book Center, an early intern who's gone off to do wonderful things, and we're delighted to have her back this evening. She's joined this evening by Ruben Shiminov, born in Uzbekistan. He's an educator, community builder, and social entrepreneur with a passion for raising greater awareness of the histories, experiences, and cultures of Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews. Previously serving as Director of Community Engagement and Education at Queens College Hillel, Ruben is currently the founding Executive Director of Sephardic Mizrahi Q Network, as well as the director of the American Sephardi Federation Sephardi House Fellowship for College Student Leaders. Thank you both for joining us. I'm delighted to welcome you on screen for this evening's program. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be back here at the Yiddish Book Center where I was an intern and uh, worked there another summer and it maintained, I maintain a, a very fond place in my heart for the Yiddish Book Center. Today, I'm going to be talking about other languages besides Yiddish, because I imagine most of you know a lot about Yiddish, and there are so many other Jewish languages to talk about. So yes, this talk will be recorded and available on the Yiddish Book Center's website. So when the Jews left the land of Israel at various stages and for various reasons, they ended up in North Africa, Europe, the Middle East, and parts of Asia. And in each of those locations, they picked up a version of the local language. So they spoke Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Provencal, Judeo-Greek, Judeo-Tajik, etc. And the two most famous Jewish languages, Yiddish and Ladino, are actually exceptions to this history because they were maintained for centuries away from the places where they originated. Yiddish originated in Germanic lands, and then Jews maintained it when they moved to Slavic lands. Ladino began in Spain, and when Jews were expelled from Spain and ended up in the Ottoman Empire, this pink area here, they maintained their Judeo-Spanish language. Now, what has happened to these languages? Well, a lot. In the 18th to 20th centuries, various historical developments led to language shift, such as emancipation, nationalism, and urbanization. And in the 20th century, tragedies like the Holocaust and various policies of the Stalinist regime. And then in the 19th to 20th, 21st centuries, there were various migrations from these areas of 
long-standing settlement to the Americas, Israel, and Western Europe. And all of these historical developments led to language shift. That is, the Jews picked up new languages and lost many of their long-standing languages. So the new languages that they picked up now have Jewish versions, languages like Jewish English, Jewish Latin American Spanish and Portuguese, Swedish, French, German, Russian, and Hungarian. And these Jewish language varieties are thriving because Jews are thriving in these lands. And the longstanding Jewish languages are not doing as well. Uh, but this is how this is what we're going to talk about today. So how are these long-standing Jewish language varieties faring? Well, Yiddish is actually doing very well. In Hasidic communities, Yiddish is quite vibrant. Most Hasidic Jews speak Yiddish and the children are learning Yiddish, which is the sign of language vitality. Outside of Hasidic communities, there is strong post-vernacular engagement. That means people engaging with Yiddish in ways that are not just about using it for everyday communication, such as singing songs in the language, taking classes, or doing Duolingo, which is the, all the rage right now. Now, aside from Yiddish, all of these other long-standing languages that I've been talking about are either endangered or almost endangered. Now, how do we determine what is endangered? Well, there are various stages in the expanded graded intergenerational disruption scale from a language that's used widely internationally to a language that's used for face-to-face -face communication, but not for national or educational purposes. But this screen is the, the, the stages that, that most Jewish languages are currently in that um, it ranges from threatened to extinct. So what stages are each of the men in? Well, it depends what country we're talking about. In different places, these different languages are in different stages of endangerment. So almost all of them are stages seven or higher. That is, they are, they're shifting or moribund or nearly extinct or extinct. The three exceptions are Yiddish and Judeo-Tajik and Judeo-Tat, which are both a little in a little bit of a better situation, but still endangered. And most of these languages have, well, the languages have various stages of post-vernacular activity, some more than others. So I'm going to explain, I'm going to focus on these languages, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Tat, also known as Juhuri, Judeo-Median, Judeo -Neo Jewish Neo-Aramaic, and then Rubin Shimonov is going to talk about Judeo-Tajik or Bukharian. And for each of these languages, we're going to give a brief history, talk about its current status, and then we'll explain what kind of post-vernacular activity there is in the language. Let's do it. So, Ladino, also known as Judeo-Spanish or Judesmo, this is the language that Jews spoke in Spain and then moved to North Africa and to the Ottoman Empire and maintained that language. There was a very thriving Ladino press and a lot of literature and drama and rabbinic literature written in Ladino. Today, it's spoken by several thousand people, mostly in Israel and the Americas, and some in Turkey and the Balkans, almost all of the speakers are elderly. Ladino does have official recognition and financial support in three countries, Israel, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Spain. And it's taught at several major universities, especially in Israel. There are also what are called metalinguistic communities, that is communities that form around a language even though people don't necessarily speak the language. Um, Ladino Comunita is a metalinguistic community, but it's made up of people that speak the language and write and read the language. So there is both vernacular activity, but also post-vernacular activity because 
they are not only speaking Ladino, they're also speaking about Ladino. It's an email list where all the messages are in Ladino. There are also various groups in Seattle, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles, for example, where people gather to speak and celebrate Ladino. And there is a lot of post-vernacular activity, especially surrounding food and music. For food, you have a number of foods that are originally from uh, the Ottoman Empire and other areas where people spoke Ladino and and uh, descendants of Ladino speakers maintain these foods and the Ladino words to talk about them. In the musical realm, we have various traditional and non-traditional types of music. Let me give you an example from Flori Yagoda, who recently passed away. <laughs> Okay, now I know for each of these musical clips, you'll want to hear more, but we want to get through more of them. So there's also contemporary use of Ladino in, in songs that are not in that traditional musical format, but in um, more hybrid formats. Okay, that's Sarah Aroeste singing in Ladino. Now, Ladino is also used in some educational contexts. There is a Jewish summer camp outside of Seattle called Sephardic Adventure Camp. And most of the children who attend this camp are the great grandchildren of immigrants to Seattle from Rhodes and Turkey. And they learn Ladino songs, they have Ladino word of the day activities, and they get extra points in their color war for having Ladino quotes on their banners. So Ladino is in stage 8A, it's moribund because it is used primarily by elderly people, but there is much post vernacular use and it is important for group identity. Next, we turn to Judeo Arabic. Judeo-Arabic is spoken in these yellow areas here on the map, which is quite a wide geographic span, and it has a very long history. There was pre-Islamic Judeo-Arabic and then various periods, and you might know some famous Judeo-Arabic writers like Sadia Gaon, Yehuda Halevi, and Maimonides, all of whom wrote in Judeo-Arabic. There are many varieties of modern Judeo-Arabic, from Libya to Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and Palestine. And each of these are more similar to local non-Jewish varieties than to each other, because that is the case with Arabic, that there are different varieties of Arabic in these various places. But they also have some, com the Jewish versions have some traits that are common to each other. In the 19th and 20th centuries, many Judeo-Arabic periodicals were published. The first one actually in India, in Bombay in, from, in 1856, and then subsequently in Algeria, Cairo, Tunis, Tangier, and Baghdad. Now from the 1940s to the 1960s, most of the speakers of Judeo-Arabic moved to Israel, France, Canada, Mexico, the US, and elsewhere. And now there are still sizable Jewish communities in North Africa, 
In Morocco, about 3,000, but most of them speak French today. And in Tunisia, about 1,100, and they tend to speak the Muslim variety of Tunisian Arabic and some remnants of Judeo-Arabic. The Israeli government offers support for cultural production in Yiddish and Ladino, but not in Judeo-Arabic and other languages. And this has to do with the lower prestige of Judeo-Arabic and other Jewish languages from Middle Eastern communities. However, there is some cultural production in Judeo-Arabic, especially in Israel. And um, here's an example. This is Neta El Kayam singing in Judeo Arabic. contemporary Judeo Arabic song. This is a band called Awa, a Yemenite Judeo Arabic trio. 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 Now, Judeo-Arabic is, like Ladino, in stage 8a, it's moribund, but there is some post-vernacular use, not quite as much as Ladino, and it's important for group identity among descendants of Judeo-Arabic speakers. Next, we turn to Judeo-Tat, also known as Juhuri, and here is where this language is spoken. In uh, Azerbaijan and Dagestan, it is the language of the mountain Jews, also known as Kavkazim or Caucasian, although all of these are kind of misnomers. Uh, and it's some of the towns and cities that it is spoken in are Derbent, Baku, and Kuba. There has been a Jewish presence there since antiquity. Now, if you're curious what kind of language Judeo Tat is, that's where it's located on the Iranian language family. And I'll be showing this again a little bit later because we're focusing on the Iranian and Bukharian communities. So here's Judeo Tat right here. And it's, as you can see, on the same branch as modern Persian. So it is somewhat similar to modern Persian, but still distinct enough that it kind of hard to understand for, for Iranian Jews. The language is uh, also similar to Muslim Tat, but with many differences. There were also periodicals in Juhuri, in, uh, written originally in Hebrew letters, then in Latin letters, and then in Cyrillic letters due to changes in the Soviet Union's language policies. And interestingly, this language is one of the 10 official lang was one of the 10 official languages in the Soviet Republic of Dagestan, which made it one of the few Jewish languages that was an official language of a country. From the 19th century to today, Judeo Tat has slowly been replaced by various languages, including Azerbaijani and Russian and other languages in the Caucasus region and Hebrew in Israel. Some older people still use it and parents use it as a secret language. And there is some 
post vernacular activity, uh, some music in Judeo Tat. But it is still transmitted to children in one town called Kirmzi Kasaba or Krasnaya Sloboda in the Kuba district in Azerbaijan. And here are some images from this town. Here's a synagogue, and here is a school and a cemetery. And you can see the Hebrew and the Cyrillic letters on these gravestones, as well as the tradition of putting a portrait of the deceased person on the tombstones, which is common in this region. But even in Kirmzi Kasaba, all of the community members also speak other languages besides Judeo Tat and educational instruction is in other languages. So I would say this language is in stage 6B, that is it's threatened. It is used for face-to-face -face communication within all generations, but it's losing users. Now we turn to another language family on the Iranian branch, on the Iranian tree. And here is on this other branch here, the Northwestern branch. And it is a family known as Median languages. You might be familiar with the Book of Esther, Paras Umadai. And so Paras is over here and Madai is over here. So what are these languages? Well, these are Iranian non-Persian languages, and there are several varieties of these languages spoken in various towns and cities of Iran. And th these are not mutually intelligible with each other for the most part. There are some words they have in common, and here are just a few examples to show you how different these are. So languages like Judeo-Kashani, Judeo-Isfahani, Hamadani, Borujerdi, et cetera. Um, and actually Shirazi is not in the Judeo-Median family, that's on the Persian branch. But these languages are so different that people who speak Farsi cannot usually understand these languages. Now in the mid 20th century, most Jews in these areas learned standard Persian with some Hebrew words. And that was when they stayed in their cities or towns or after moving to Tehran or other big cities. And from 1979 to the present, most Jews from Iran have emigrated, especially to New York, Los Angeles and Israel. So Judeo-Median languages are in stage 8a moribund. And interestingly, there's little interest among heritage speakers and very little or even no post vernacular engagement. And I'm going to speak a bit about Jewish Neo Aramaic, which is also spoken in this area here, part of Iran, but also Iraq and Turkey. This is the Kurdish region. And the Jewish community there goes back to antiquity, of course. And their language does too, but it has changed a lot since antiquity, as all languages do. The Jewish Neo-Aramaic language is related to the Aramaic of the Talmud, but it is quite different. And it, it was spoken in several towns, sometimes by several thousand people in a particular town, but sometimes by just a few families in small villages. And the way that it was spoken in each of these places was pretty different. Uh, you can see the blue dots on the map are the Christian are the Jewish communities and the red dots are the Christian communities. This is from a um, language documentation project of Neo-Aramaic. And the Jewish dialects are interestingly more similar to each other than to the Christian dialects of their, their, their neighbors. So here's just a few examples and you can see that the Jewish words are more similar to each other than to the Christian words, right? Now, Jewish Neo-Aramaic speakers also spoke local languages in most of the world outside of the United States. Multilingualism is pretty common. And so they spoke Jewish Neo-Aramaic, but they also spoke Kurdish, Turkish, Farsi, Arabic, or, and or Russian. And most of the speakers moved to Israel in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and some to the United States and to Europe. In Israel today, there are some elderly Jews who speak Jewish Neo-Aramaic, 
um, Kurdistani Jews and Nashtidan from slightly different places, and they speak slightly different versions. And in Jerusalem, both of these groups have monthly cultural gatherings, poetry readings, stand-up comedy, and call-in radio shows. But the participation in these events is dwindling as the competent speakers age. But there is some other post-vernacular engagement. In fact, there was a book called My Father's Paradise by Ariel Sabar about his father, Yona Sabar, who is a scholar of Jewish Neo-Aramaic and also a native speaker. Highly recommend this book. And despite this post-vernacular engagement, this is also in stage 8A. Most of the speakers are quite elderly. And now I turn it over to Ruben to share about Judeo-Tajik. Thank you so much, Professor Benor. Um, such a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna start sharing my screen and we're gonna do in the next uh, 15 minutes a, uh, a dive into the, the history, um, the present state of, of uh, Bukhari, Judeo-Tajik and um, the trajectory of it, where it's going in the future. So we're gonna try to accomplish a lot in uh, about 15 minutes, um, but I'm very excited to, uh, to share this information with you. So I'm gonna start <clears throat> sharing right now. Okay, so first of all, just for us to all be on the same page, when we're talking about Judeo-Tajik, about uh, the Bukharian uh, language, we're talking about the language of um, a community with deep roots in Central Asia, in the heart of Asia, um, a place uh, sometimes referred to as like the land of the stands, right? Where uh, countries like Uzbekistan, present day Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, um, historically also Turkmenistan where Jews have lived. So we're talking about um, a region in the heart of Asia where um, Jews have lived for centuries, if not millennia. And um, a very, very brief survey of the history. I mean, the story begins for this community with the Babylonian conquest of Judea and the subsequent exile of Jews eastward over 2,500 years ago. Um, now, these, this community, like other communities east of the land of Israel, lived in, um, in the region before the arrival of Islam. And so this region really is can be seen as a, a, a kind of a greater Iranian region uh, historically with important empires like the Achaemenid Persian Empire um, that was founded in 559 BCE, during which time Jews um, then moved even farther east into the easternmost parts of the Persian Empire, which is present day Central Asia. So again, the story runs very deep. The next big chapter is the conquest um, the, of um, <clears throat> Arabian um, uh, armies from the Arabian Peninsula and the arrival of Islam. But through this, the, the small Jewish community remains. And we'll see the layers of all this history reflected in their language, in uh, Judeo-Tajik, um, the Bukharian language. During this time, we already actually have uh, some of the first examples of Judeo-Persian inscriptions, um, archeological evidence in Afghanistan in the eighth century. Uh, this is followed by a revival of the Persian language and subsequent Turco-Persian empire in the region, um, <clears throat> but now through an Islamic lens. Uh, but again, the Jewish community continues through all these periods of conquest and different empires. The next big uh, chapter in the, in the region is the, uh, the rise of Turco-Mongol empires. So again, we're seeing all of these different cultural and linguistic influences, and the Jewish community continues to uh, to remain. And that is a source of a lot of pride for this uh, relatively small community in comparison to, um, to our neighbors in, in the region. During this time, we can talk about uh, a, a golden age, if you will, a, a, a um, um, flourishing of Judeo-Persian literature um, that again um, is affects the communities of what is Iran proper, but also Central Asia and Afghanistan, because we're talking about kind of one bigger Judeo-Persian uh, uh, community. This is the inscription uh, found that was found in Afghanistan in Tangi Azal from the eighth century. 
<clears throat> the next important chapter in the history of Jews of Central Asia is the emergence of the Khanate of Bukhara and subsequently the Emirate of Bukhara. And this is, by the way, where we get the name Bukharian Jews. It's the Jews who were living in this, um, in this region, largely in the Khanate and then Emirate of Bukhara. Bukhara was the capital of this uh, empire. During this time, we see the emergence of a more distinct Judeo-Tajik uh, linguistic tradition. So Tajik is the Eastern Central Asian variant of Persian. And Bukhari or Judeo Tajik is the Jewish variant of that. There continues to be a relationship and communication with Jews from Iran and Afghanistan uh, during this time and migration of Jews from those regions. So we are still talking about a, a Judeo Persian, uh, a greater Judeo Persian world. And that's important to remember. In the 1800s, um, the this traditional music of the region, Shashmakam music, uh, we see uh, Bukharian Jews um, playing this music in the royal court of the Amir. And the lyrics of this, uh, of this music is largely Persian. Um, and again, from that will develop a kind of a Judeo-Persian, Judeo-Tajik musical tradition among Bukharian Jews. The next important chapter is the colonialism of um, the Russian colonialism in, in the region. And this predates the Soviet Union. Uh, we're talking about Tsarist times right now. And during this time, there is actually in Jerusalem, a very interesting chapter um, that in, in the history that emerges, uh, which is the migration of uh, wealthy Bukharian Jewish merchants in the late 1800s to Ottoman Palestine. And they actually um, re, like spark a, a Judeo-Tajik and really a broader Judeo-Persian literary uh, and linguistic revival. We'll get to that uh, briefly uh, in, in a moment again. Following Tsarist Russia, the Soviet Union, and again, we're just sprinting through history, but hopefully this gives you an appreciation of the multi-layeredness of Bukharian Jewish history and the, how that affected has affected the language of, um, of the community. So during the Soviet Union, which is very much a century of ambivalence with various ups and downs, in the first couple of decades, um, there was actually state-sponsored uh, support of Bukharian language school, uh, school books and schools and the press, literature, and theater. But by the 40s, <coughs> pardon me, there's a sudden halt by the Soviet regime of this, apparently they thought, you know, we, we sponsored it enough. And there was an increasing Russification of the Bukharian Jewish community in terms of the language, in terms of um, having uh, more of the community be uh, proficient in Russian. And for some folks, even having Russian be their, uh, the language that they're most fluent in. For example, my family from Tashkent, by my parents' generation, my mother, for example, can understand uh, Bukharian quite well. She speaks it um, semi-well, but Russian is the language that she's most proficient in, and myself included. Now, the post-Soviet era, um, which we are in now, um, is, we see the mass migration of, <coughs> can, okay, can people hear me? Someone has to speak louder. Okay. Uh, we see the mass migration of uh, Jews to Israel and to the US. Um, Professor ben -Or, may you just tell me if, if people can hear me well? Can someone uh, let me know? I think it's okay. Okay, wonderful. Somebody, I, I just got a text, somebody said to, do, to speak louder. Um, so the mass migration of Bukharian Jews to Israel and the US really emerges during the final years of the Soviet Union and the post-Soviet era. And, and with that migration, there is actually a re-emergence um, both in Israel and the US of um, the Bukharian language press, of Bukharian literature, um, broadcast shows, performances, the arts, theater, this is a uh, photo just because images are important for us as we are going down this uh, history and appreciating the rich cultural legacy of the community. This is a photo from 1910 of Bukharian Jews in the important historic city of Samarkand. Another photo of the community in Samarkand celebrating uh, Sukkot. This is the Bukharian Jewish community or a family celebrating Sukkot, but now in Jerusalem. As I said, there was this movement in the late 1800s and the founding of a Bukharian quarter. 
And this is my family in Tashkent in 1905. I'm very blessed to have this photo. So a little bit more about the present day. So the dissolution of the Soviet Union happens in 1991. As I said, the mass migration to Jews uh, of Bukhara and Jews to Israel in the US. So where are we right now? So the population is approximately 250,000 with uh, the majority living in Israel, but a significant uh, amount living in the US uh, with Queens being really the hub, the center of Bukharian Jewish life in, um, in the world with about 50,000 Bukharian Jews living in Queens. And as I said, the community is vibrant now with synagogues and businesses, uh, the press, there's even a Bukharian con World Congress. But in Central Asia, friends, the story is coming quickly to an end. Uh, there are about 1,500 uh, Jews in Uzbekistan. Uh, this is a photo of uh, uh, like a typical photo of uh, when the Jews were leaving and during the collapse of the Soviet Union, all of the things that we were selling as we were starting life anew in the US and in Israel. These are some articles that were written in uh, the broader press, National Ge Geographic, New York Times, about the dwindling community in Central Asia. The last Jew of Tajikistan actually died January 21st of this year. But again, the story continues in a vibrant way in Queens. This is the Bukharian Jewish Community Center. It's also a synagogue, uh, uh, the, the place where the Bukharian, Bukharian Times and newspaper is published, uh, the, um, uh, the offices of the Bukharian Jewish Congress in the US. Right? This is an example of the press uh, that is written largely in Russian, but also has an English section and often has a Bukharian, a Judeo-Tajik, uh, a smaller section uh, as well. And this is where uh, the younger community is right now. I was privileged to work at Queens College Hillel for several years. Um, and uh, through that engaged many Bukharian Jewish students who go to Queens College. And this is a, an event we had where we, where we invited uh, musicians and folk dancers um, and, and uh, singers of Shashmakam, this traditional Central Asian uh, musical genre. We invited them to our uh, to our Hillel, and they sang in Judeo Tajik in, in Bukharian. This is um, a, a, an exhibit in Beit Hatfutsot, in the Museum of the Jewish People in Tel Aviv, uh, highlighting Bukharian Jewish history. So the story continues musically, linguistically, in many ways. Um, so as I mentioned, Judeo-Tajik is an Eastern Central Asian variant of Judeo-Persian, and it very much falls within the bigger history of Judeo-Persian, the Persian languages that Jews spoke, that can be divided into various uh, periods that we're not going to get into too much, but um, I just wanted to mention the time periods. And it covers a range of many uh, genres, Judeo-Persian and Bukharian literature, including translations of uh, Jewish works like the, uh, um, the Humash, the Torah, uh, poetry, historical works, and dictionaries. And it's a great example of the way in which um, Bukharian Jews both integrated with their broader world while also <clears throat> uh, maintaining a certain level of resistance, a certain level of distinct identity. Because after all, this was a Judeo-Jewish -Ver variant of Persian written in Hebrew script uh, for most of its history. I wanted to just show you a few examples, early examples of Judeo-Persian, uh, because again, that's important to contextualize the Bukharian language that we've been talking about. So here's, for example, um, another document that was found in Afghanistan. Uh, it's a letter dealing with financial issues. This was found in the 10th century. And this document was found as far east as Western China, Chinese Turkestan, Xinjiang region, uh, a place that more, more people now know about because of um, uh, what is happening with the, um, unfortunately, with the Uyghur people in the region. And this dates to the 700s. Now, I'm not going to get into too much of uh, all of these figures, but I want to just briefly even just put on the slide these important literary figures that were uh, central to, uh, particularly during the kind of the golden age of Judeo-Persian, um, that connected, again, Iran to Afghanistan and Central Asia. You had figures like Molana Shahin Shirazi, uh, this uh, author, th this poet that comes from Shiraz, and in the 1300s, influenced by Persian Muslim um, poets like Firdausi and his epic, Shah Noma, the epic of the Shahs, influenced by that, Molana Shahin Shirazi wrote Bereshit Noma, the epic of Genesis, or Musa Noma, the epic of Moses. So again, we see this influence 
um, and this conversation with a broader society, but then this process of making the language and the literature distinctly Jewish. And this continues with people like Imrani, who wrote Hanukkah Nama, the, the epic of Hanukkah, and in Bukhara, Daniel Noma, right, the epic of Daniel. Um, and other figures like uh, Raghib, who also comes from Samarkand, this is Central Asia, uh, Yusuf Yahudi, who comes from Bukhara and writes a poetic versification of the story of uh, the seven brothers, um, the seven sons of, of Hana. This is actually a manuscript of that poem. And this is a beautiful manuscript of Emrani's Fatnama, the, um, the Book of Conquest, which is a poetic versification of um, uh, the book of, uh, of Joshua. This is a beautiful manuscript, an illuminated manuscript of Ardashir Noma, a poetic versification of the story of Esther written in Judeo-Persian by Shahin Shirazi, very, very much seen as like the godfather of uh, Judeo-Persian. Um, now, connecting it back to more modern times and to the Bukharian story, and I know I have probably a couple minutes uh, uh, left. Uh, if, um, if I can have a couple minutes, that would be, uh, that would be wonderful. So Shimon Chacham um, is uh, an important figure for us to, uh, to, to, to know about as we appreciate uh, modern uh, Judeo, uh, Tajik, uh, uh, the Bukharian, uh, la Persian language of, of Bukharian Jews. So he was born in Bukhara, but is, was one of the founders of this Bukharian quarter in Jerusalem. And so he was among those migrants that went uh, westward to Ottoman Palestine and established the Bukharian quarter. And he was a very important figure in the in the field of printing and editing Judeo-Persian manuscripts. Because in Jerusalem, there was a printing press. So now these works from people like Shahin Shirazi centuries ago could be printed en masse. Also, Shimon Chacham vocalized his text. We'll see an example in a second. And so uh, in doing that, uh, we can actually uh, um, uh, really um, make a claim that you know, he was publishing in Judeo-Tajik because the pronunciation of Bukharian Jews, our pronunciation of Farsi, is different from that in, of uh, Iranian Persian. And the, um, the, the vowels that he included, the nekudot, uh, showed that, that he was using the pronunciation of Central Asian Jews. This is a printed version of Ardashir Nama, this, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the manuscript that we just saw a couple slides ago, right? The poetic versification of Megillat Esther. This, friends, is in Hebrew script, but this is Judeo-Persian with Bukharian vocalization. Uh, another uh, printed, uh, um, another book that Shahin, uh, Shimon Chacham printed, this is the Musa Noma, the Epic of Moses, again, in the Bukharian vocalization of Judeo-Persian, written by whom? Originally, Molana Shahin, uh, our teacher Shahin, right? Um, this is Shimon Chacham's own tafsir, own tr Bukharian Judeo-Tajik translation of uh, the Chumash of the five books of Moses. So we have the Hebrew on the right side with the Aramaic and on the left side, we have uh, the Judeo-Tajik. I'll just read a second of it. Dar aval biofarid chudoi azmar on osman ve azmar on zamin. Just to give us a, 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 a sense of how, how this sounds. Uh, Shimon Hakam wrote many other, uh, published many other books printed that were previously only available via manuscripts and himself uh, translated many books, including this Passover guide, which was published in 1907, and then republished again in Jerusalem in 1964. It would have Hebrew in it, and then the Judeo-Persian uh, uh, translation. This one also, by the way, includes Arabic, <laughs> which is very, very interesting. Um, other books that were uh, uh, reprinted by Shimon Chacham, and again, often in those, the front pages, he refers to the language as Lashon Farsi, the Persian language. So Bukharian Jews definitely saw themselves as part of, again, the broader Judeo-Persian world, but still recognized themselves as being from, as we can see here, Bukhara, the city of Bukhara and its surroundings. 
This is uh, a, the Judeo-Tajik, Bukharian rendition of Echad Mi Yodea, the Passover song, Who Knows One. But this, friends, is uh, again in our uh, Judeo-Tajik dialect. And so, for example, here it says, Yakumin ki medonad, who knows the first? Yakumin man medonam, I know the first. Yakumin chudoi rabul olamin, the first is God, master of the world. What's interesting is not only is there Persian in here, but rabul olamin, this is actually from Arabic, rabul alamin, master of the worlds. But there's also uh, Hebrew sprinkled in here. Panj Sifre Torah, the five Sifre Torah, books of the Torah, right? So we see that interesting syncretism. Um, and this is a more recent copy of the Haggadah in 2000. So again, the story continues and the importance of this language, even if it's not used every day as a, as a language of communication for many Bukharian Jews, it is still very, very important. I'm actually not going to play you the uh, snippet of it because I want us to uh, move forward and, and, and finish up. Oh, one second. Okay, I want to finish with um, a few uh, examples of other, other examples of Judeo-Tajik uh, literature and, and writing. This is a dictionary uh, that was published um, in 1907 in Bukharian, right, Judeo-Tajik, but also in Hebrew and in Russian. And it makes sense because this is a time when there was, a, you know, the beginning of a Russian colonialism in the region. And so it's called Kitabi Lugat, the book of languages, Belavsi Farsi. Lavsi, this is actually another ver, a word to use for, for, for language. Um, but it also has Ivricha and Rusicha. Cha, this is actually the Turkic influence that is in uh, uh, Central Asian uh, Bukharian Persian, uh, which means Hebrew language and Russian language, like Turkche, you would say. And then also written in Russian, um, Tajikski Slavad, the Tajik uh, dictionary. And in it, you have the alphabet, right? Because for many, they're learning for the first time at this point, Cyrillic, which ultimately actually, you know, the bulk of Bukharian Jews know how to read and write in Cyrillic and know Russian. But this is the beginning of that story. And then it's like a phrase book, right? It's, it's organized so logically. So we have, for example, pronouns, man, I, but then in Hebrew, ani, anochi, and then in Russian, ya. And if just in case you don't know how to read Russian, they transliterated it into uh, using Hebrew script uh, they transliterated the Russian. It's fascinating. And here's just, you know, entries in the dictionary. Well, then this, uh, 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 pub, um, uh, this author, Shlomo Baba John Pinchasov, who was based in Jerusalem and one, was one of the founders of the Bukharian Quarter, he did, he won up <laughs> this previous dictionary. And he wrote a dictionary in six languages. Lashon Kodesh, Hebrew, the holy tongue, Persian, Russian, Ispanyolit, Spanish, Aravit, Arabic, and Turkit, Turkish, right? And so in it, again, it's very pragmatic the way it's organized. Probably this was for merchants, right? And so it needs to be, because in it, there's also a prayer for the sea, prayer for the road. So for example, we have here this uh, 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 words about time, right? And it's broken down by all six languages. Shana, Hebrew, uh, for year. Saul in Persian, right? Again, they call it Farsi. Bukharian, we call it now, but they call the language Farsi, Persian. God in Russian, Anyo, Sene, Ili, right? So it goes on and on. This is a, a fascinating find, and I'm so happy to have this dictionary, um, uh, to have been able to access it. And then there's also phrases. Again, because you might need to know this as you're traveling, right? So good morning. This is Persian, but written in Hebrew script, but also in Russian, Spanish, Arabic, and Turkish. Man, so a bit about the written word. Um, so Bukharian was in, in, in manuscripts, it was written in a uh, kind of an a cursive script. We often call it Rashi script. Um, this is kind of similar to Ladino Solotreo and, um, and other Jewish languages that um, when they were written by hand. And so here we have examples of poetry. Um, written uh, by Bukharians um, by hand, and we can uh, see the uh, the script, which is which is beautiful. This is a speech that was given uh, in Bukharian in Judeo Tajik at the opening of a Bukharian Jewish school in 1900 by David Kalontar. And again, we can see uh, that the font is a bit different than printed 
uh, find. Uh, this is a poem that was written, uh, this is kind of a reprinting of it in Latin script. It was written that originally by uh, a woman, Shulamit Tileyot, who was the granddaughter of Shimon HaKam, this very famous rabbi. And again, we see the interplay of Hebrew and Persian in here, right? So for example, um, uh, over here, just quickly, Mulo Shimon HaKam, Mardi Torah. Uh, the, the, the teacher, the, 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 uh, the spiritual leader, Shimon Hacham, was a man of Torah, right? Mardi Torah, this, the morphology is, is, is fascinating. Um, as I mentioned in the history, the next, uh, uh, an important chapter in modern Bukharian history is the, uh, the Soviet encounter. Um, and so, as I said, in the first couple of decades, there was actually official Soviet support of uh, what were known as like red Bukharian newspapers, right? And Judeo-Tajik, the Bukharian language, was given an official uh, minority status in Uzbekistan. So we have, for example, these two newspapers, Roshnai, this one was published in 1925, and Rahamim, this is published in 1910. Here they are still using the Hebrew script, right? But then later, they would start using the Latin script. This is a primer uh, written in 1937 using the Latin script for Bukharian Jewish uh, students. And, um, and uh, so from Hebrew, then there was a transition to, to the Latin script as we see here as well. Um, here is a, an example of kind of when that transition uh, was made. Um, and I can, I can only imagine how confusing it was for students who were first of all studying with one uh, orthography and then with, an, with another. But then ultimately the, uh, the Soviet Union stopped supporting it. And that was the end of a uh, state-sponsored state uh, Bukharian Jewish literature in, um, in the Soviet Union. Uh, but the story continues among the community. So uh, I would just want to mention a few interesting phonological um, and morpholo morphological peculiarities. So in the, the pronunciation of words that we would take from Hebrew, they would go through a kind of a Persian process. So Shabbat becomes Shabbat, uh, Mikvah becomes Mikbeh. Um, things like Yom Kippur, the day of, become, uh, of day of Kippur becomes Ruzi Kippur. And I know uh, we are out of time and this is perfect because we're getting to, to, uh, uh, to what I wanted to finish with. The story friends continues with uh, language guides that are being written this, to the, uh, this day to engage the younger population, often written in Latin script, um, but uh, also sometimes in Cyrillic script um, uh, because of the, 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 the Russian influence. So these are two examples of those books. Poetry continues to be written by poets in the community in Bukharian, in Judeo-Tajik. And often these are lyrics to then songs. Um, this is a poem, I am Jewish, uh, Persian Tajik is my language. Yehudiyam force Tajik zabonam. Um, and um, I will, I already spoke about Chashmakam, uh, about the traditional music that has continued. Um, and this is actually an example of the way that post vernacular activity continues through food. Sorry, this should say food, not music. For example, this meal, Oshi Savo. We know, we, uh, even if me, who doesn't speak Bukharian so well, I know this meal, sorry, this one to the right. It's the meal for the morning. That's literally what it means in, in Persian. And this is our Shabbat stew. And then finally, um, there are other ways in which in the media, the languages continues, whether it's online through jewishlanguages.org or the Endangered Language Alliance, whether it's through uh, social media and engaging YouTube videos uh, like this one uh, uh, that was organized by my friend Bahadur Alast and featured my good friend and someone who um, is a real uh, a consultant for me with Bukhari, Bobby, uh, Bobby Ishakov, and uh, or uh, shows in Israel like Efo Atahai, a show about a young Bukharian guy uh, negotiating his Bukharian identity against the backdrop of modern Israeli society. So I'm going to end with that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you both. Um, what a really, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and I think we have probably a lot of questions. So let's see if we can get to them. I'll just toss them out and then I will leave it to um, you, Ruben and Sarah, to figure out which ones you want to answer. Um, one question is, could you briefly touch on Judeo-Italian or provide any resources to learn more? Sure. So in, as I said at the beginning, in each location where Jews have lived, they have spoken a variant of 
the local language. And I just happen to have a bunch of dictionaries on my desk here. This is uh, a grammatical book about Judeo-Italian, and it has a lot of information about the Hebrew words in Judeo-Italian. And that is the case in Jewish languages around the world. There are a lot of Hebrew words. As Ruben mentioned in uh, Judeo-Tajik, there are many Hebrew words, and that is the case in, in most Jewish languages throughout history. And they're integrated in interesting ways. In Judeo-Italian, for example, you have the word gainare, which means to see. It comes from the word ayin, the Hebrew word ayin meaning I. And they pronounce the letter ayin as ng in Rome in particular. So that's just one of many examples of how Jewish languages incorporate words from Hebrew, not just in the religious domain, but in regarding everyday life. And the same is the case for Judeo-Arabic. Um, and in fact, the, in addition to Hebrew words, you also have some archaic features, that is features that are a little bit outdated in the Jewish language compared to their non-Jewish neighbors. And you might have some migrated regionalisms, that is features from one language, from one dialect of that language, like Judeo-Italian spoken in the South that appear in Judeo-Italian in the North. Of Italy. And same goes in the Judeo-Arabic speaking world. You might have a feature from Morocco that appears in Egypt, for example. And participant asked, what alphabet does Bukharian Tajik use? So um, as, I, as I mentioned, there it depends what time period we're talking about, right? Traditionally, the Hebrew alphabet uh, was used, and then um, uh, the Latin script under uh, some years of the Soviet Union. Uh, what, but what continued after the, the kind of the halt of official Soviet sponsorship of the language, uh, the la alphabet that continued to be used among most was the Cyrillic script, because Tajik, which continued having an official status in the Republic of Tajikistan was written in the Hebrew script. So uh, today, uh, when you find, um, you know, poetry or, or articles in Bukharian, in let's say the Bukharian press, most often it is written in the Cyrillic script, but among the younger generation and to engage the younger generation, uh, some of these um, uh, dictionaries or phrase books or primers will use uh, the Latin alphabet now. But there's really no uh, you know, one official uh, alphabet or writing system that is used. That's a good way to segue into a question, which is I, maybe for both of you, do you find that a younger generation is now engaged and are you hopeful that these languages may survive? Well, for Yiddish, yes, I'm very hopeful uh, it is surviving in the Hasidic world. And there are small pockets of non-Hasidic Jews who are raising their kids in Yiddish. Ladino, very few families are raising their kids in Ladino right now. Um, Bukharian, uh, Ruben, you want to say a little something about that? Yeah, I would say, look, in, in some ways it is kind of a, a race against time. Uh, the generation that spoke it, uh, that speaks it, fluently, very proficiently, that generation is, is getting older. Um, and, and among the younger, for example, my generation, there are those who are still highly proficient in it, but, um, but that number is uh, much smaller as compared to previous generations. But what gives me hope is all of this post vernacular activity is the fact that through music, right, through, <clears throat> uh, pardon me, through food, through different educational experiences and, and talks, through um, uh, the media, like social media, what I was saying, there is kind of a new engagement among younger uh, Bukharians. And there is a desire among the younger generation to connect to the language um, in some way, if not for you know being maybe not with a goal of being fully proficient, but as a way to continue taking deep pride in their distinct Central Asian Jewish identities. Question is, uh, what was the economic, social, religious forces that would foster Jewish variants of the majority language? Wouldn't it make trade, marriage prospects from adjacent villages, for example, more difficult? Yeah, wherever Jews have lived, they've been integrated into the local society to varying degrees. And 
That's why in general, Jews tended to speak a variant of the local language. And even where they did not, when they spoke a Germanic language in Poland, for example, they tended, many tended to be bilingual and to be able to have that communication with the outside world. But it served very important purposes to have a distinctive language or language variety that is unique to Jews because Jews had a unique community. And, and that's the case for any minority group, no matter how similarly they speak to the majority um, society around them, they are likely to have some distinctive features because they tend to spend time with each other. But for Jews, it's not just about spending time with each other. It's also about the unique needs of the community, specifically having many Hebrew and Aramaic words because they engage so much with the biblical narrative and with their liturgy and having distinctive customs and foods, rituals that they need to express in, in their language for which there are not words in the surrounding language. So all of these lead to distinctive features. Another thing that leads to that is the migration patterns. The fact that Jews came to the current land from a previous place. And so sometimes they maintain elements of that. In fact, and to answer another one of the questions, Jewish English is a great example of that because in America, the Yiddish language has been such an influence on the speech of Jews that in addition to having Hebrew words and Aramaic words and distinctive intonations, there are many influences from Yiddish in Jewish English. Um, and that is the case even outside of Ashkenazi communities. There might You might use some words like shul and daven, right? Um, but outside of... Uh, Ashkenazi communities in communities whose ancestors spoke Ladino or who spoke uh, Bukharian, you're going to have some words from Ladino or Bukharian or Judeo-Arabic that are part of the community. Their Jewish English is influenced by their ancestral languages. So yes, Jewish English is developing very similarly to how other Jewish languages developed, with one exception the writing system, because in America today, Jews, like all Americans, are very likely to be literate in English. At the time when Yiddish, Bukharian, Judeo-Arabic, these other languages were born, literacy was not as widespread. And so people learned to write those languages in Hebrew letters. Today, we don't need to write it in Hebrew letters because we have access, we are required by law to have access to the literacy in our local languages, but there are still examples of people writing select English words in Hebrew letters, like names of sports teams and universities, for example. Um, so before I let you both go, um, could I ask you to give a very quick, maybe minute or so, um, just a bit about the work that you're doing. Um, uh, maybe Ruben, do you want to just quickly tell and then Sarah follow? I mean, a lot of in relation to what we're talking about here, um, it's I, it's a blessing and a privilege to be giving many talks like this to uh, both young folks in my uh, in my community, but also to engage um, other communities, uh, whether it's the broader Sephardic Mizrahi world, uh, whether it's uh, creating space for interfaith Muslim Jewish conversation and again using the Bukharian experience and our language as a way to bridge those gaps. Um, it's it's really a powerful way when we can connect that past to the present through language, through music, through culture. It's a really powerful way to 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 create those bridges. And um, that's one of the one of the things that really gets me excited is how can we um, use this culture, uh, uh, these stories, um, the, the the language, the music uh, as a way to both empower particular communities whose stories maybe have been on the margins, but also as a way to create those uh, those bridges. And I feel very strongly that we need to document these endangered Jewish languages. So I started um, a project called the Jewish Language Project at Hebrew Union College, where I work. And our goal, I put the link in the chat. Oh, here, I'll put the link in the chat for you. Um, the goal of this organization is to document the 
endangered Jewish languages and to raise awareness about them by doing this kind of talk. And um, Ruben, I think in addition to all these talks you're doing, you should start a Bukharian book center <laughs> because it seems like you've already collected a lot of those books and it would be great if you could digitize them like the Yiddish book center has and make them available to the world so that in a generation or two when people want to learn the language of their great grandparents, they'll have that ability. Um, and I'll be happy to, to help you in any way I can. Um, and in addition to doing this documentation work, um, I also want to uh, see Jewish schools and summer camps teach a little bit about Jewish languages so they learn about the diversity of the diaspora. And I'd also like to see more post vernacular activity in these languages. So thank you very much for inviting us here to speak about this today and for all the wonderful work you continue to do at the Yiddish Book Center and in 7,000 languages. And there's just so much wonderful documentation and education work going on now that we're pleased to be part of. Well, um, I just wanna thank you both for an enthusiastic and obviously passionate um, presentation that you are doing much to champion these languages and you've really given us a, a lot of insights and Sarah, thank you for taking your Yiddish studies in all sorts of directions. Um, since our participants can't see the chat, I will just give you the URL um, where you can learn more about what Sarah's work um, is all about. It's jewishlanguages.org, jewishlanguages.org. So again, thank you both. Um, keep up the good work and we hope to welcome you here to the center and we'll speak a little bit of a lot of amalgamations <laughs> of languages when we see you. Take care, stay well, and thanks again. Take care. Um, tonight's program for all of you is part of an ongoing series of programs brought to you, as I like to say, live from the Yiddish Book Center. I hope you'll join us uh, this coming Tuesday at 7 p.m. when we present the next in our Great Jewish Books Lecture Series. This Tuesday will be Family Secrets and the Graphic Novel, Rutu Modans, The Property, and Nora Krug's Belonging with Tanir Oxman. On Sunday, May 16th at 2 p.m., we are proud and privileged to present again our annual Melinda Rosenblatt lecture. This year, the lecture will be delivered by Jonathan Sarna. The title of uh, the lecture is Jews and American Politics, Historical Ideals and Contemporary Realities. You can register for both of those programs and you can see our full calendar of events, including the recently announced July 11th Yidstock Virtual 2021. So we look forward to welcoming you back uh, in the future. Again, yiddishbookcenter.org slash events. And before I say good night to all of you, a big, huge thank you to all of our members who support makes all of our work possible. And all of us here at the Yiddish Book Center continue to work just as hard as we possibly can in the midst of a pandemic to keep Jewish uh, culture and Yiddish culture alive and we need your support now more than ever. If you want to help us continue this critical work, please consider making a donation, a tax-deductible donation, at yiddishbookcenter.org slash donate. Until we see you next time, stay well, stay safe, and thank you again for joining us. Good night. <laughs>